Red Dwarf has had something of a fractious relationship with mobile phones. We've had everything from the Diblifier that hasn't worked on phones released in about the last five years to, well, these. Step up to Red Alert. Uh, sir, are you absolutely sure? It does mean changing the bulb. <laughs> but now, with a new Red Dwarf game available on Android and iOS, is there finally something for the fans to get behind? I'm Alex from Gaspacho Soup, and I'm here to talk to you about Red Dwarf 11, the game. Previously, official Red Dwarf video games began with the mobile game Simulant's Revenge and ended with the DVD quiz game Beat the Geek. Fans have often talked about the desire for a proper Red Dwarf game, but as much as we may all wish for a big budget Star Wars type game adaptation, the reality is that popular as the show is, it doesn't quite have the level of global interest to make it viable for a games company to produce a console based game. A mobile game however is a very different affair with different goals, and one that allows for a staggered release. Such is the case with Series 11 The Game. Presently one sixth of the game is available, with 11 levels based on the first episode of the series, Twentica, and a further 5 episodes worth of content to be released over the coming months. The $1.99 price tag therefore makes for excellent value in terms of hours of gameplay. But what of the quality of the game? One of the major stumbling blocks for any Red Dwarf game idea is what form should it take? With some series being far more low-key than the action-based episodes from series 5 through 8, how do you capture the myriad qualities of the show? The game has several answers to this question. By basing itself specifically on one series and one episode at a time, it only has to encapsulate those episodes, something that is best achieved by a mobile release that can time roughly against the TV show. It's not entirely beholden to what was featured in the episodes though. For this Twentica section, the game starts two weeks prior to the beginning of the episode, featuring the crew discovering a ship and salvaging the casket of Kronos that the Exponoids will later be in search of. It's a great way of expanding the possibilities on offer, and not getting bogged down into trying to replicate what features in just a half hour of television. This plays into the biggest strength of the game, which is variety of gameplay. Does a Red Dwarf game work best as a puzzle game? Does it work best as a shooter? Or maybe a flight or driving game? The truth is that all of these aspects have their plus and minus points. With the game, the developers have instead made the sensible choice of choosing a variety of different mini-games that require different skills, and this stops things from becoming too stale. It's an ambitious approach for a game limited by its mobile format, and consequently the game takes on something of an arcade dynamic, with a limited range of controls to allow for far more expansive levels and worlds. Navigating an asteroid storm in Starbug, then the ship will be on rails to allow you to concentrate on shooting. Winding your way through the streets of an alternate America, then your motions are limited to stop you from going backwards. But do these limits that might be more familiar in an arcade game make a mobile game less enjoyable? We'd wager not. Again, there are different expectations on a mobile game and a console game, and it needs to be something that can appeal to casual gamers as well as more seasoned ones. Mere days after release, the game had already been updated by developers' game digits to make it more accessible to players that found some of the levels near impossible to complete. They improved the camera controls, changed the layout of the enemies, and added all important health pickups. Sadly, it also removed two hilarious glitches that caused Rimmer to walk to his death through a ship's hull into deep space, and led Crichton to bounce 70 feet into the air repeatedly over neighbouring buildings before falling into an inky black oblivion. The game may now be better for their removal, but they're comical sights we wish we could see again. The gameplay on offer in the Twentica section of the game falls into four main categories. Number one, in-flight shoot 'em up. This accounts for the opening sections of the game where you take control of the mining laser on Starbug to shoot oncoming asteroids and to scan the derelict ship. This is perhaps the level that's been the most well received, and it's not hard to see why when piloting the bug is something that most of us have always wanted to do. It's fast paced and you have to be quick to avoid being repeatedly smashed in the face, but when you can take in the graphics in between mashing the screen with your thumb, there's a lot to love here. Number 2, On Foot. This makes up a fair chunk of the gameplay. In the Rimmer Hostage section, this largely involves dodging hazards for the first half of the level before obtaining a bazookoid. We then get a second half where Rimmer gets to take out the exponoids he encounters, but to add some difficulty, players must time their shots very carefully, while Rimmer swings his weapon manically from side to side like that one really irritating guy in the gym shower room. The other on-foot missions with Cat and Crichton meanwhile are both stealth affairs. If we're honest, while this is mostly achievable, there are certain parts where it seems impossible to be stealthy, leading you to run away from gunfire as quickly as you can, sometimes straight into the path of oncoming traffic. Number 3. Driving or Flying 
This is the other big type of gameplay on display. Piloting Starbug on the Time Wave feels particularly arcade-like, with the tap of the screen determining if you fly clockwise or anti-clockwise, and is probably one of the levels you're most likely to return to after completing the game. There's also a chance to drive through the streets of alternate America in what before the update was a level that was hard enough to have fans curled up in a ball, weeping at having lost the game for the 571st time in a row. Fortunately, these controls have now been greatly improved, meaning it's now possible to progress through the level without causing more fatal collisions than an Italian bus driver. Number 4. Other mini-games Linking this all together are several smaller games, normally based on one screen. Some of these definitely work better than others. The Starbug control section, for example, is an enjoyable affair, if only for the good chance to look at the controls and imagine you're piloting the bug. It also takes on a perhaps unintentional level of difficulty for users with a small screen. Trying to navigate certain buttons on the dash requires a level of precision that the sausage-fingered amongst us will fail at as we mash the screen with our engorged digits. The speakeasy entrance section, meanwhile, works slightly less well. In concept, it's sound, and the tying of various questions to the series is very welcome. Unfortunately, it's sometimes prone to repeating itself, meaning you'll get the same question several times in a round. But for a section that is a brief linking one, it's hard to get hung up on. That equally applies to the Crichton Recharge section. One that doesn't ever really present a challenge, but one that does give us a chance to get a bit more enjoyment out of a good visual gag from the show. While these make up the basic level tights, there is some repetition, with both the time surf and driving levels repeated at the end as the dwarfers try to escape. It's fortunate that both of these levels are very enjoyable, so a return to them doesn't feel like a chore. We'd expect similar reuse in future levels of the game, but considering the amount on offer here, it feels petty to begrudge it of the developers. Fundamentally, the game is a surprisingly impressive affair. Whilst what we might have expected in advance was a game that would just focus on one part of the show, it instead tries to provide an extra way of enjoying each new episode of the series. This includes the now skippable cutscenes, with a condensed version of the episode script. They don't have the accompanying dialogue that would have likely had to be re-recorded, and some may not want to click through all of the script, but in providing a way of experiencing an episode from start to finish, the game would feel incomplete without them. What perhaps is a surprise, though, is the delightful model shots that the game recreates in digital form. It would have been far easier just to use a still image as with the dialogue scenes, but the effort gone into here is hugely enjoyable and something we hope to see more of in future levels, even if it can't be used for everything, as the game amusingly acknowledges by telling the player what scene to think of for the crash sequence. If there's an area where we'd like to see an update, however, it's in the audio. While we fully understand the need for cutscenes to be subtitled rather than to have full sound from the show, there are a few instances where the use of background music would help. As the game stands, the levels play through with the only sounds being the diegetic ones of gunfire or explosions, or the sounds played to acknowledge you picking up a reward. With music often being a big part of the model sequences and action scenes in the show, it's a slight shame to not have them in the game, especially with the rich array of music that Red Dwarf has to offer. The most obvious example, though, is the end of the game, with the to-be-continued screen that flashes up once gameplay is completed. It seems a missed opportunity to not have the end titles music playing as the credits of the game makers go past, especially when the game is based on and follows an episode structure. There's every chance that the rights and clearance may be an issue to the use of music, and it's hardly a massive mark against the game, but rather a nitpick on an otherwise highly enjoyable affair. And like Lister's Indian Order, that's the big takeaway. What we'd expected was a very limited game due to its format and platform, and instead it's turned out to have had a lot more care and attention put into it to a degree that we simply didn't anticipate. The graphics are detailed, the gameplay is good, the involvement of Doug Naylor and story expansions make it a nice supplement to the episode, and even if speeding through the episode in an hour, the $1.99 price tag feels entirely reasonable for the fun distraction the game provides, especially when you take into account there are five more episodes to come. It's also been great to see the developers so active with the fans to try and improve the game and make it as enjoyable as possible. On the basis of the Twentica levels we've seen here, we're very excited to see what Game Digits can do with the different styles and stories that we've already seen in Samsara and Give and Take. We'll be covering those editions as they're released here on this channel. And that's our review. Have you played the game? What were your thoughts? Is there anything you're hoping to see in future levels? Let us know in the comments below, and if you enjoyed this video, then please like, share, and subscribe to this channel. You can also check out our website for the latest Red Dwarf news, reviews, features, and the latest episodes of the Garbage Podcast. 
I'm Alex, and from me and the rest of Gaspacho Soup, we'll see you later. <laughs>